Amen. <clears throat> I love uh, the picture of having the kids here at the front. I'm reminded, I think it's Psalm 127, verse 4. I think I quoted it a while ago when we prayed for the kids, how kids are a blessing from the Lord and how we ought to treat them um, as we would an arrow. Um, they have potential, but we as older people, as adults, as parents, have a responsibility to release that and to equip them, grow them in godliness, and then release them into their full potential. So it's a challenge to parents. And we believe as a church that when there are families with children, we all have the blessing of being uh, mentors and examples to those children. So there's always little eyes on you. So, um, so always be aware of that. And you have influence for these young kids. So just uh, before I start, obviously our mission trip uh, team got back uh, last week. They had a good time. Uh, it was quite funny. I had a lot of people tell me they couldn't come to laugh groups. Some guys took a day off. Some people said they couldn't be on worship today because they were recovering from the mission field. So I said to Trent during the week, I was like, what did you do to them, bro? Um, but such is the nature of missions. Uh, it, is a, it is a hard task. So well done for those who went. Uh, good job. Um, so there'll be a really cool report back uh, next week. Okay, so turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We, sorry, I keep saying that. Romans chapter 12. All right, Romans chapter 12. That's where we're going to be this morning. We were there last week, and um, we really, in depth, for 30 minutes, we unpacked verses 1 and 2. There's so much in it. Um, if you did miss it, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. Um, but last week, um, in a nutshell, we, we looked at the first aspect of the title that I used last week, serve him personally, so serve God personally before you serve him publicly, okay? Serve him personally before you serve him publicly. And we saw how we were told, not by me, okay, but by the scripture, by Paul, to lay ourselves down as a living sacrifice to the Lord, a complete surrender of ourselves to God. We saw then how we do this. And when we do do this, we are evidently never the same again. Paul made that point. We are never the same again because our hearts, our minds, our souls, the whole of who we are is transformed. We looked at that word metamorphosis from one form to the other. It's completely transformed. You are never the same again for those who have met Jesus. And as a result of this, Paul landed. He said that the will of God is then revealed to us as we pursue these things. So that was our personal service to God that we looked at last week through a sincere commitment to God, right? And now this week, that foundation that we laid last week now goes public, okay? Now goes public. So let's read. Romans chapter 12 from verse three. Here we go. Paul says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, what Ben just said. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts, he goes on to say, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. He goes on to say, prophecy. Let us, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality or freedom, um, he who leads with diligence and perseverance or perseverance, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So this encouragement that Paul is now giving us today on the back end of last week uh, flows directly out of the call for total commitment, all right, that we studied. Today we see what that practical outworking of our personal commitment to God is going to look like. However, before Paul gets there, okay, and before he can address the church, he now practically takes a poke once again here at the heart of man, okay, and he's appealing here to everyone. That's important because not a single person sitting here today is exempt from that. He's appealing to everyone. And I made three observations from this text, and the first one is this. No pride, only humility. Verse three, have a look there. I encourage you to have your Bibles open. The first observation I'd like to make this morning is no pride, only humility. Notice with me here, once again, as in verse two last week, Paul now gives one negative and one positive command. Paul's big caution here is against pride, point. 
It's against pride. And the reason he's giving this caution to everyone is because Paul, more than likely, based on what he was saying, had an understanding, right, that there were some in Rome at this time who thought that they were better than others, based on the gifts that God may have blessed them with. Now, this is, a hu- this is a natural human tendency to want to sometimes think of ourselves too highly than we ought, hence Paul's caution. Paul was urging them. He was urging them here. Remember, he started last week with, I beseech you. It's a powerful word. He's urging them. He was urging them here to not allow the importance that they think they hold to be something that led to pride. Sometimes spiritual giftedness can lead one to harbor feelings of pride. But Paul is saying, this is not good. So Paul urges them. He says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Don't allow your ego to win. That's what Paul is trying to get to here. He doesn't leave us there like last week. He gives us a solution. He suggests that we think of ourselves with sober judgment. Sober judgment. Ultimately saying that when we see ourselves... So when you look at yourself and you look at others, we are to esteem them higher than ourselves and this results in humility. And the best verse I could think of for this is Philippians 2 verse 3 where it speaks about how Jesus, his his characteristic of his service, of the way in which he lived his life, his complete and utter other person-centeredness. Let me pause there. Demonstrated in the communion table today. He died so we didn't have to. Other person-centeredness. Not dependent on them, but dependent on himself. So Paul tells us here is how they are to do this. He says this. Think about your identity, here is. Who you are in Jesus, what he has done for you, should humble you, should not lead to pride. He says, view yourself as God views you. He says, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, In my study this week, I've landed here. This is not necessarily saying that the stronger your faith, the more accurately you're going to think about yourself. I consulted a couple of scholars here, and I think this word measure here is correctly translated as like the the idea of a standard, the standard. And the point I want to make is this. The standard, the benchmark by which we are to see ourselves is Jesus. He is our standard. He is our example and the lens through which we are to see ourselves. Why? Because if we hold Jesus as the standard of our faith, okay, looking to him, looking to his person, looking to his work, the way he led, the way he served, that example will lead us down a path of humility, not pride. And then if we understand that the work of Jesus was necessary, because of the condition of our hearts, we then begin to realize the state of our hearts that should completely eliminate pride and instill humility. There's nothing good in our hearts. So we need Jesus. That'll eliminate pride and instill humility. So the first practical outworking is this. No pride, only humility. Paul made that point. Our second observation is this. Have a look at verses four and five. You're a part of the whole. This is very important. You're a part of the whole. Now that Paul's addressed our identity in light of Jesus and how he views us, because that's most of that's paramount, how Jesus views us, it's only then that we can understand and we can correctly see the body as a whole. All right? Have a look at the text here with me, verses four and five, and let's notice three things together. Notice these two words here, one body, Paul uses. Those two words there, one body. It tells us here about the unity that believers are to understand and embrace. The unity believers are to understand and embrace. Paul's making the point that if you have have received salvation through the person and work of Jesus, you are part of the body of Christ that is being spoken of here. Fact. You're part of the body of Christ being spoken about here. So this unity is first spiritual, right? And then it becomes physical. Why? Because we individually come into relationship with Jesus And then we experience that faith corporately, living out our faith in a faith-based community. Robert Mounts would say this, and I love it. He says, there's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. No such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. 
And Paul is stating a fundamental truth here that you are saved into a greater community of believers. This unity is so important. And I wonder if you can remember a couple of weeks back, um, I spoke a little bit about the, the Jesus' high priestly prayer. And the latter part of that, when he is praying for us, sitting here today, the believers that will come to faith as a result of the apostles' teaching and his disciples at that time, he was praying for us. And as big as aspect of his prayer was the fact that we would understand, we would know, and we would embrace the unity that him and the Father, the Trinity have, and the unity that we see at creation. His prayer was that we would understand that unity and embrace that unity. And he goes on to say here in verse four, but all the members do not have the same function. And now this tells us that in this unified body, there is diversity and there has to be diversity. So with this unity comes diversity. And I wanna say this, that the effectiveness, I wanna be bold, I wanna say this, the effectiveness of the body of Christ is directly related to the diversity of the body of Christ. And I thought about this. I know some friends and I know some family that have, have maybe had a body part that isn't functioning properly. Uh, maybe it's a hip, it's a knee, it's an elbow, a shoulder, whatever it may be. And when that happens and when that comes about, uh, oftentimes we see that it's either replaced, it is repaired, or there's some sort of medical treatment that is needed to allow that one body part to now function properly again so that the whole can function as it's supposed to, okay? So a new hip, new knee, new elbow, new shoulder, whatever it may be, okay? And the point is this. I also thought about an athlete, speaking about body parts, who wants to function at the absolute optimum, okay? They cannot run that 100 meter sprint as well as they would if their hamstring's not okay, or if their quad isn't all right, okay? Everything has to be functioning. The diversity of muscles, the diversity of body parts have to all be good in order for the body to function at it's optimal. The body of Christ, friends, because Paul's using very, very simple language here. He's relating us to a body. The body of Christ reaches its full potential when the diversity of the individuals and their gifts are being used for the good of the whole. That's the point he's bringing across here. And I want you to hear this. You and your gifts, everyone sitting here, they matter to the whole. They matter to the body of Christ. You and your gifts matter. No matter how big how small, there's no difference. They matter to the whole. And he goes on to speak about, in verse five, how we are members of one another. Members of one another. Speaking of a mutuality, which means the sharing of a feeling, of an action, or a relationship between two or more parties. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks of the same idea of the church. It's people being many members, but a part of one body. And in verse 26, it says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So everyone feels every part of the body. And I couldn't help but think of a time where, have, have any of you maybe hurt yourself before, where you've either broken something or you've had to have stitches on an extremity or something like that. You've hurt yourself to the point where you're in pain and so often we find when we hurt ourselves, the rest of the body hurts as well. And a beautiful example that I could only think of was, I think I was either grade 11 or grade 12, after water polo training, I was in the water for about two hours, and then, now your skin's all soft, right? And then I was helping one of the ladies move something, and then as I turned around, the trolley we were moving caught the back of my foot and pulled my heel down. And I had to have stitches, right? And the point I'm trying to make is this, for about two or three nights, I remember just, I had five stitches in the back of my heel, that's all it was but my whole body could not sleep because of this pulsating throb in my little foot. My whole body was feeling sorry for the one little heel, okay? Because they mutually were feeling the same thing, experiencing the same thing, okay? My heel is a part of my whole entire body. And I wanna say this, that we as believers, we belong to and we need one another. We are mutually a part of one body and that is something that we cannot deny. We're saved into community. We ought to share in the truth of the gospel, what Jesus has done, and strive to act on that truth by means of our service and witness as a whole, together, using our gifts. And in that, we get to share in the grief of ministry, in the grief of the gospel, the hardship of the gospel. We get to share in the joy of the gospel. We get to share in the successes and the failures. 
So I want to say this, that you are all a part of the whole. There's no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. Hold on to that. You all matter. You all have a part to play. Third observation I made was this. We're going to spend a little bit more time here. Verses 6 and 8. You've got a gift. You best use it. And if you don't think you have a gift, I'm going to prove to you that you do. All right? So Paul mentions seven gifts in the text below. And this list isn't all inclusive. There are scriptures such as 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10, as well as verses 28 to 30, Ephesians 4, 11, that these elaborate on other areas of gifting. And in general, I would like to say as well, they are just general areas that people are gifted and God uses them, okay? You don't see necessarily keyboard playing or guitar playing that I'm clearly not gifted with, okay, hence this morning, all right? That people are gifted and God gives abilities to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. And because all these areas and these gifts that Paul has now mentioned here, the seven, I have to be faithful to this text. That's the beauty of expository preaching. I can't just miss some of these. I have to be faithful to this text and I need to address them, I need to explain them and we need to apply them, okay? So what then is a spiritual gift? Wayne Grudem gives a really, really beautiful summary of what a spiritual gift is. It's this. A spiritual gift is any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in any ministry of the church. That is what a spiritual gift is. And before we dive into this, we must be clear that every single gift that is given to the church is a result of grace. It is a result of grace. Therefore, I want to make this point. The gifts are not given on the basis of merit, on the basis of works, or how well you can handle your gift necessarily. That's not how they're given. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, with regards to the distribution of gifts, it says, but one and the same, sorry, it says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So if gifts are given purely by means of grace, Isn't this a statement that I'm about to read to you that we can all take caution from? Listen to this. Dave Gazek says, man in the depravity of his heart finds a way to be proud about spiritual gifts and insists on exalting men for how God is gifting them. We must be careful of that. Paul alluded to that now, verses three and four. We must be careful of that. So last week I mentioned how we can't elevate people above others that results in idolatry. It really does. We start to elevate people above others. And it's the same with gifts. We need to be very careful not to put people on pedestals because they're either a good preacher or they're a good teacher or they're a good leader, they're a good deacon, they're a good worship leader. We've got to be very careful not putting people on pedestals. We're just the same. So let's have a look at the gifts that Paul mentions here and see how they apply to us today. The first one he says is prophecy. Prophecy. Now, This is probably one of the gifts that when we mention sends chills down the spine of many today because we see in the biblical times and we see today that this gift is exploited, it's misused, it's not used appropriately and it's taken completely out of context, okay? So with the time we have and the study that I've done, I'm gonna do my very best to articulate the truth and the relevance of what prophecy is, okay? I don't think we have enough time to do do a complete justice this morning, but I'm gonna do my best. So here we go. In the Bible, okay, we often see prophecy was used in a more predictive sense, okay? Old Testament was used in a very predictive sense, specifically when the Old Testament major and minor prophets were predicting or they were foretelling something that God was going to do, whether negative or whether positive, against his very own people or against the enemy of his very own people. Now, The Old Testament prophets, this is important to understand, they wrote and spoke words that had absolute divine authority, okay? Absolute divine authority. They were able to confidently say, if I can say this, quote unquote, with Bible in hand, the Old Testament prophets, they were able to say, thus says the Lord. And when they said that, the very words that came out of their mouth were the very words of God, because that was God's channel to work through to bring a message to his people, all right? When we read the New Testament, before we get there, a lot of scholars would agree that to put things in context for you, John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets, proclaiming the kingdom of God was at hand before Jesus came. 
And now when we jump to the New Testament, we still see prophets functioning, okay? We have texts like Acts chapter 11, 27, chapter 13, 1, 21, 4, 21, 8 to 9. Today, Romans 12, 6, 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 29, we have 1 Thessalonians 5, um, 20 to 21, where it says, don't despise prophecy, but test it. However, one thing we have to understand is that the Old Testament prophets' counterparts in the New Testament are the apostles, not the prophets, all right? Who, the, the apostles were the ones who spoke and they wrote the very words of God and they had them recorded in Scripture. So the Greek word for prophet in the New Testament era had a range of meanings. And I was studying with Wayne Grudem here, and these are some of the definitions that were used in that era. Someone who, um, it wasn't someone who necessarily spoke God's very words, but someone who speaks on the basis of external influence, one who has supernatural knowledge, or a spokesman was a word that was used, right? In the New Testament, these words did not allude this is important, did not allude to the prophets having divine authority as the prophets in the Old Testament had, okay? Helmut Kramer defines it as such. He simply expresses the formal function of declaring, expressing, or making known, then goes on to say this, yet because every prophet declares something which is not his own, the Greek word for herald is the closest synonym. Starting to make sense here. Wayne Grudem says this regarding prophecy in the New Testament. That much more commonly, the word prophet and prophecy were used of ordinary Christians who spoke not with absolute divine authority, but simply to report something that God had laid on their hearts or brought to their mind. Now, for time's sake, let me apply this. So if this be the case, Old Testament prophecy and New Testament prophecy, okay? Prophecy is not then and it cannot be a divine new revelation from God that is yet to be revealed. Why? Because God's revelation in Scripture, His special revelation, the way He's revealed Himself to us, is complete. The Christian canon, it's complete. Prophecy cannot be predictive as the Old Testament functions were. They were predicting, foretelling something. Rather, as 1 Corinthians 4, 14 Verse three says, but he who prophesies, he who prophesies speaks edification, speaks exhortation and comfort to all men. So let me apply it like this. Prophecy today would take this form, I believe, based on the fact that prophecy is non-authoritative, meaning it's not the word of God because that's the word of God. It is not predictive and it's revealing nothing new. It would be something like this, I believe, God laying something on the heart of a believer for another believer, hear this, that will edify, that will encourage, and that will bring comfort. And this is done primarily through scripture, through scripture. And if you have a scripture, let me encourage you today, church, if you have a scripture, if you have a thought for someone, someone close to you that is going through a specific season, pray about it, share it with them. And you know what the beautiful thing is? They have the right to either accept or reject that. 1 Thessalonians 5, don't despise prophecies, but test them. Let me land this point with this. Kent Hughes says, this gift is normally the communication of revealed truth in a manner that convicts and builds up its hearers. John Piper alludes to this, that there's a prophetic aspect towards preaching. This is revealed truth that is being heralded, proclaimed, that is there to edify, convict, and build up its hearers. Let me say this, if prophecy is forthtelling, something that has already been revealed, may I be bold and say then that the revealed truth of Jesus, his person, his work, is that which needs to be forthtold and proclaimed in our preaching, in our teaching, and in our everyday witness. We aren't to get caught up on the gift, but the content of it. Leave that one there. He goes on to speak about ministry and service. The gift of ministry and service. Now this is a beautiful one and I hope it challenges you because this word ministry and this word service, all right, is the same word that we derive the word deacon from. Same word that we derive the word deacon from. And the responsibility here would be to serve in practical ways. 
And now this is a broad gifting that would most likely be found to be evident in every believer's life, every believer's life. And it's the general serving that would be expected of every believer. So we are all called to serve. This gift, I believe, it finds itself in many of our hearts. He goes on to speak about the gift of teaching. Now this refers to instruction that is based, based on and founded in the word. So teachers of the word of God. And I believe that those who have this gift can find themselves in areas where we are called to teach, such as, think about this, parents sitting here today, you have an, a biblical obligation to raise your children in the way of the Lord, to teach them in the way of the Lord. What about our KBC kids teachers that we entrust to teach our KBC kids? We have preachers and teachers who are responsible for shepherding their flocks and teaching their flocks with good sound doctrine, biblical teaching. Or life group facilitators and leaders who are entrusted the responsibility to teach in their life groups. Let me encourage you with this. If you happen to find yourself in a place of teaching, Kent Hughes has these thoughts, and I want to read them to you, some posing questions, and read them slowly so you can hear all of them. Before you begin to teach, parent, or teacher, preacher, whoever you are, before you begin to teach, ask yourself these questions. Have I listened to God's voice? Have I laid my own reason in the dust before God in order to take it up again? enlightened by him for the use of my work? Have I, being spiritually alert and dependent on the Holy Spirit, have I gone again and again to the word of God to refresh my own soul before speaking to others? Have I tried to live out what I preach? Parents, Sunday school teachers, have I tried to live out what I preach? Brad, today, I'm not gonna leave you all hanging there, myself included. Have I acknowledged my sins when the Lord showed them to me and repented of them? Have I recognized moment by moment my utter dependence upon the Lord? Have I been lazy? Have I been diligent? Have I insulted the Lord by feeding his sheep with ill-prepared food? Some questions to ask before we begin to teach. He goes on to speak about the gift of exhortation. Now, the gift of exhortation is characterized by someone encouraging others to live out what it is they've just been taught. So these go hand in hand. Exhortation is the gift where someone encourages others to live out what they've just been taught. Again, Robert Mounts, he says, if teaching provides guidance for what people ought to do, encouragement helps them achieve it. And based on that, I wanna say this, that we don't want any fat sheep, okay? That's the point I wanna to make today. We don't want any fat sheep. What do I mean by that, okay? If our Brad just sat and I ate 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 and I did nothing else but eat, what happens to me? I grow, okay? Because that's what food does for us, all right? Those who are taught but not exhorted become spiritually fat cheap. So the importance of teaching comes to light in the importance of those gifted with encouragement to help others act on what they have been taught. So this gifting is important. And the big idea behind this gift of exhortation is the idea of somebody coming alongside someone else. And the best analogy I could think of, because this text lends itself to a lot of analogies, I don't think I swam until I was probably eight, nine, maybe even 10. I'm not too sure, my parents would know. But I didn't swim until I was, you know, yeah, probably nine or 10 or so. And the reason being, I was scared of the creepy crawly. If my brother wasn't with me, I wouldn't go near the pool. I was scared of the weir. There was a big black hole. You don't go near that. Or that thingy that blows all the bubbles. And then to throw a span into the works, you put a mosaic dolphin at the bottom of the pool, I'm out. You know? <laughs> Anyone else experience that? That was scary. So I didn't, swim. I didn't swim until I was probably, yeah, like nine or 10. But you know what? I thought about this. Teaching, exhortation. It took this. It took a family member one day. My parents weren't even around. It was my grandparents, okay? My parents weren't even there. It took a family member of my grandparents to say to me, Brad, no, let me teach you. This is what happens when you swim. You hold your breath, etc., 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 and then you swim. And then what he did is, he took me by the hand and he came alongside me. So he taught me and then he encouraged me. And then I was able to swim. And from that day on, I loved the water, okay? So that is just a prime example of how when you teach and we exhort and encourage, you go hand in hand. 
So this gift of exhortation, this gift of encouragement can be seen by means also of warning in the giving of godly advice and just counsel and general encouragement. That's how we can see this. So if this is the gift that you have, may I suggest this, church, that you wear yourself out encouraging your fellow believers to practice and implement what it is those who are gifted in teaching have taught us. Encourage others. It's needed, very much. The next gift that he speaks about is giving and generosity. And as soon as I read this, giving and generosity, I thought about Trent, because I don't know if anyone's had a meal with Trent, but you go to his house, big, beautiful meal, and then he offers you a second plate and he forces you a third, okay? So he's very generous like that in the best way I could think about this. So he'll see this. I'll apologize if he doesn't like that. But um, this gift is used by God, okay? This gift of giving and generosity. It's quite a special one, actually. This is a gift that is used by God as a channel through which God provides resource to his church and his body, okay? And the person who is blessed by God, and I say that because everything we have is from God, And the person who is blessed by God and has capacity and means to give should do so with complete freedom and not reluctancy. That's the attitude through which they should be giving. There should be no ulterior motive, but only love. So if someone in the church has it on their heart to buy one of the musicians a guitar, you don't buy them a guitar and say, I'm gonna give this to you only if you sing the artist that I like. That's not the kind of giving we want. Or someone has it on their heart to one day in the next 10 years repaint the church. So I'm going to buy all the paint, but as long as you paint the whole church purple, okay? No strings attached kind of giving. It's cheerful, it's unreluctant, and it's done with love, okay? There must be no reluctancy. So when we give, this is very important, when we do give, it is to bring God the glory, number one. It is to advance his kingdom, number two. And it is to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ, I wanna encourage you, if you have this gift, use it. God has blessed you, use this gift. He goes on to say, he who leads. So those who hold positions of spiritual leadership in the church, maybe church pastors, elders, deacons, life group leaders, hear this. We are not to just wing this leadership position God has entrusted to us. We are not to wing it, okay? Paul says that a level level of diligence is needed here. A level of diligence is needed here. This leadership is focused on the building up of and the benefit of others. So if we're gonna be building into other people and benefiting them, we've gotta use God as a resource and prepare ourselves, not just wing it, to build in to people. So those who are in a position of leadership in the home, keep going here, in the position of leadership in the home, At school, embrace that position with diligence and perseverance, keeping in mind the big picture of the gospel. Paul then lands these gifts with the gift of showing mercy, and I think this one is absolutely beautiful. And some people in our church who have this very evidently. And this gift would entail working with the poor, the underprivileged, caring for the sick, the elderly, feeding the hungry, could be probably seen in so many other different forms. But for the one who carries this out, it should never be done out of obligation, but rather with complete cheerfulness and complete joy. That is how this gift needs to be exercised. And think about it like this. And I love that they give advice because it makes sense. Think about those who are facing affliction, who would be met by this gift of mercy through someone. They would be delighted if they are met with the heart of cheerfulness and joy And I want to encourage you that if this is something you're feeling like you're wanting to do, we have avenues here at KBC that you can exercise this gift to show mercy to other people. Chat to us. I want to land by saying this, that Paul makes it very clear elsewhere in Scripture that these gifts are given for the common good of the church. Spiritual gifts that the Bible lists are given for the common good of the church. They are there to edify the church They are there for the building up of the church. They are there to equip the church. And they are given for the primary purpose of the advancement of the gospel. Now with that being said, if the gifts being used are not being used for the common good, to edify, to build up and equip, this should raise a red flag, church, as to whether there is sincerity in the practicing of that gift. That is what those gifts are there for. 
And if they aren't being used for that, what is the motive? So let me land by saying this. You have a gift, all of us. Use it. And I can confidently say that because if you came back to me and you said, I don't have a gift, Brad, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to say you do have a gift because faith is a gift. And if you've received Jesus, you've received the gift of faith because it's got nothing to do with us. It's given by grace. And faith itself is a gift. If you've received that faith, faith enough to put your life, your trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you to use that gift of faith and bring others to the Lord. Convey the message of the gospel. So even if we don't think we have a gift, we've been given the greatest gift. And I want to transition our thought now on that note. Paul has been speaking about gifts and giftings and what it does to the church. And I just spoke about the greatest gift. And today we get to celebrate communion, which is amazing. And I have to go here. That we can think about all these gifts, but they are all superseded by one gift. Ultimately the giver of all of them, that is Jesus. Jesus who himself we understand as believers who was completely fully God he was fully man he died a death that we deserve seen here today in the body and his blood for us he died a death that we deserved he was buried he rose again three days later and he conquered death and he ascended to the right hand of the father and his death was done because we deserve that because of our sin Yet he took the blow for our sin as seen here today he is the one who was the substitution, the substitutionary atonement for our sin. His body in place of ours and his blood poured out for us so that those who believe in the person and the work of Jesus, it is them, John 3, 16, who have the privilege and the gift of having eternal life with the Father in heaven forever. So with that thought in mind, church, that Jesus Christ is the greatest gift demonstrated here in his body for us and his blood for us. I'm gonna pray and then what I'd like to do this morning is just for this to be a contemplative time. Adam's gonna play some music at the back just now but what I want us to do after our prayers, please come forward, grab the cup, grab the bread, spend some time with your family or your friends and just pray. Contemplate, just sit and think about the greatest gift that supersedes everything that Paul has just spoken about. He's the means that we can even talk about these spiritual gifts. He's the giver of these gifts. So Jesus, we thank you very much today that yes, Lord, there are many, many gifts that are given to us that bless our hearts, Lord, as we can bless others. Lord, we see that you give these gifts freely and by your grace, not on our merits, nor on our worth. And it makes me think, Lord, about the greatest gift, you, Jesus, who was given not on our merit, not on our worth or what we have done, but given unconditionally with an other person-centered mentality. Lord, as we see these representations of your body, we think about the way in which you hung on the cross in our place, Jesus. You died in my place. And we see the cup, Lord, your blood poured out for the remission of sin that only you, Lord, could fix. So Jesus, as we, as we come to this table today, I pray, Lord, that we could examine our hearts for those who know you, Jesus. We could examine our hearts and say, Lord, is there sin, unconfessed sin in my life that I need to get rid of? And we can leave that chair, Lord. And then secondly, Lord, for those who don't know you, today we can, as we look at this table and we hear this message, we could pose that question to ourselves. Do I know the giver of all these good gifts, Jesus, who gave himself as the ultimate gift? We thank you, Lord, for who you are and your mercy and your grace that has been shown to us. In Jesus' name, amen.